And I go to the doctor and she says, oh, you're a second year med student. You're hearing all these diseases and you think that you have one of them. This is just medical school stress. And I said, wait a minute. I was in the Peace Corps. I lived on a dirt road in Paraguay by myself for two years. My mother died unexpectedly after four months of pancreatic cancer. Uh, I've never responded to stress this way. Hey everybody, Dr. Axe here. Hey, welcome to the Dr. Axe Show. Today I have Dr. Amy Myers, and I've known uh, Dr. Amy for a long time. I've been so impressed with her work over the years. Uh, she's an expert, and I've seen so many things she's done in helping people with gut health, thyroid issues, digestive issues, also especially autoimmune disease, uh, she's an expert in, and she's written two New York Times best-selling books. Uh, she's a former emergency room doctor, and she's worked with thousands of patients over the, over the years and at her functional medicine clinic in the past, helping people get well, and now she's really focusing on making a global impact through her website, uh, Amy Myers MD. Dot com, where she really helps people get to the root cause of their diseases uh, and helping people heal. And she reaches people all over the place. I love her stuff. Uh, Dr. Amy, hey, thanks for uh, being part of the show today. Thanks, Josh. It's awesome to be here. Congratulations on all your success. Hey, thank you so much. I, uh, there's several things I want to d dive into today that I've heard you speak on, and I'd love to hear you share with everybody. And that is how to be autoimmune disease. I would love to talk about candida and even dive a little bit into thyroid and digestive issues. Sure, absolutely. So I myself had Graves disease, which is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid. And you know, my motto is, or my saying is that conventional medicine failed me and it's my mission to not have it fail you too. Hmm. So I unfortunately took the conventional route. I didn't know anything about functional medicine at the time. And so I had my thyroid ablated, which is basically blown up like Hiroshima and I no longer have a thyroid and I am having to take, um, you know, a thyroid hormone for the rest of my life because of that. And so I really vowed as I went into medicine um, to help people not have to go through what I've gone through. And I have helped many people with Graves disease and all other kinds of autoimmune conditions, reverse them, get off horrible, toxic, you know, immunosuppressive drugs and really get their life back. So I'm excited to talk to you about it. That's awesome. I mean, I, I always love hearing when people, when somebody has a story of, hey, they've overcome something. And, you know, when I talk to most physicians uh, or people in the health space, I find that a lot of times they got into medicine or nutrition through a health crisis in their family, or a lot of times it's them themselves. And so I love hearing that uh, you are doing this for a mission. You know, you don't want people to necessarily have gone through what you had to go through. Um, and I know, again, you've helped so many people. So, you know, one of the things I, I love, you have a program online and it's about how to beat candida. I'd love for you to talk to me a little bit about what is candida? What are some of the other side effects and things it can cause? And then let's, let's start jumping into how, how we can fix that. Yeah, absolutely. So what I saw over the years, I've worked for the past decade in, a, in my functional medicine clinic. I'm now retired. But um, when I was seeing literally thousands of patients from all over the world, I saw that there were really five root causes to all chronic illness, including autoimmunity. And that's our diet, leaky gut, toxins, infections, and stress. And into the diet and sort of leaky gut arena, I saw that almost all of the patients that I saw, and literally over 10 years, over a decade, I saw thousands of people and they were flying in from all over the world and almost all of them had candida overgrowth. Mm. And so candida overgrowth is not something we should have. Maybe everybody has, you know, there's some debate whether everybody has a little bit of candida or not, but the theory is that there's a little bit of candida in our gut. Our gut sits there, as you very well know, as a mic our microbiome, sort of as a rainforest. Everything's there in this very delicate balance. So maybe there's this little bit of yeast in there. We use the words yeast and candida interchangeably because candida is the most common form of yeast. You could have a different form, but candida a little bit sits in your gut and it really helps us to digest and absorb a lot of our nutrients. Now, when something happens to you like a C-section, you have to take a round of antibiotics, you're maybe on proton pump inhibitors or acid blocking medications because you have reflux, or you're just maybe eating a high carb diet, full of sugar or alcohol, wine, things like that, this rainforest can get out of balance. And that's when, depending on what's going on, candida can overgrow, SIBO can overgrow, potentially parasites, different things can overgrow. Here we're discussing candida overgrowth. So candida can overgrow. And when that candida overgrows, that is what really leads us to all kinds of problems. 
the, the theory is that candida kind of lays this layer over your gut. 95% uh, of our neurotransmitters are made in our gut, our serotonin. So if that layer of yeast is there, you can't make that serotonin. As the yeast begins to get into its hyphae form, which it does, it kind of pokes holes into your gut and causes what we believe to be leaky gut. Mm. And as many of your listeners likely know, leaky gut is really perceived to be the precursor to so many different conditions, particularly autoimmunity. And we're finding out about a lot more chronic conditions and even possibly cancer. So in treating people with autoimmunity, the first thing I ever wanted to do with them was to heal their gut. And one of the first things that I did when I was healing somebody's gut would be to get rid of the candida overgrowth. Yeah, it's a great point. It's so interesting. And it's this delicate balance of, uh, you know, candida is natural. It's the overgrowth that becomes such a problem as with, as, as it is with most microbes. And typically it's interesting, you know, they, they love feeding off, off sugar, which is so prevalent in our diets today. You mentioned another condition that can oftentimes go come to, you know, go hand in hand with candida and that's SIBO. Talk to the audience a little bit about what, what is SIBO and what are some of the things that you've done for that uh, as you've treated patients in the past? Absolutely. So SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, is where even good bacteria in your small intestines grow. Most of our bacteria is sitting in our large intestines or our colon. But for various reasons, whether maybe you have an autoimmune condition and you don't have good peristalsis, maybe you're eating a diet high in sugars and carbohydrates, maybe you've gotten some antibiotics, a lot of the same uh, precursors or, um, you know, two candida can lead to SIBO as well. A lot of people have them hand in hand and some people, you know, get confused. So I can kind of talk about the differences in what I see yeah. if you're someone out there suffering. Um, and we do have a quiz that we can probably refer you guys to. Um, don't have that right now, but I will get it to you that Josh, sure. you can put in a free yeah. quiz that people can take to see if they have candida or SIBO. And it's, of course, I have this quiz in all of my books as well. But so SIBO is this overgrowth of good bacteria in our small intestines. That, of course, can lead to a whole host of problems as well of not digesting and absorbing our nutrients. So SIBO, what I typically see for SIBO is bloating. Um, so, um, you know, that wake up, my, my belly's thin, and by the end of the day, I look six months pregnant. Of course, that's an extreme, but we, I would have patients all the time like that. Um, Candida, 50 percent, oh, excuse me, SIBO, 50% of the people, there's research out there showing 50% of the people who've been diagnosed with IBS actually have SIBO. Mm. So if you've been diagnosed with IBS, you probably want to go, you know, uh, get a breath test for SIBO or take this quiz that uh, Josh will share with you later. Um, rosacea is another thing that I see very commonly with SIBO, but SIBO tends to be um, uh, very specific to the gut. It doesn't have a lot of systemic um, symptoms short of if you also have histamine intolerance, uh, SIBO can lead to histamine intolerance. And so I've seen people, myself included, this is how I realized and started writing about histamine intolerances is that I had SIBO. I got rid of my SIBO. I no longer had my histamine intolerance. Candida, on the other hand, has a lot more systemic um, effects. Uh, the candida itself produces um, something called acetyl aldehyde, which is a byproduct when you drink, you know, a glass of wine or beer, your body breaks down that alcohol into acetyl aldehyde, aldehyde. And that can be very toxic to our brain. So people have memory problems, they have brain fog, um, uh, they have neurologic symptoms. Uh, candida, I see people having a lot of skin issues, unexplained rashes, hives. Um, of course, they can have bloating as well, digestive issues. Um, nail fungus, recurrent vaginal yeast infections, um, and again, leading to leaky gut and leading into even more symptoms such as autoimmunity. So um, I have quizzes for both of these in both of my books, The Autoimmune Solution, The Thyroid Connection. I've also written a book, The Autoimmune Solution Cookbook. So quizzes there, hopefully we'll get you a link. You can share that as well, Josh. And I've developed two programs. I mean, after working with thousands of people in my clinic with these conditions, and then seeing after writing books, more people needing help, I developed um, the Candida Breakthrough Program and the SIBO Breakthrough Program, and I can certainly talk about the differences in how one overcomes each of those if you'd like. They share a very similar diet, but sort of how we treat those uh, with very natural supplements, or should you want to go with you know, pharmaceuticals, um, I can talk about the differences in both of those as well if you'd like. Yeah, you know, I, I think one of the things that the audience would love to hear is uh, specifically somebody who's listening to this and they do have SIBO and they do have candida. For those 
particular conditions, what, what are some things they can start doing today? Is there, what are, what are the biggest dietary changes? What are the best supplements or herbs or teas? What, what, what are, are there any lifestyle things? Like what are some things that people can start doing to see improvements with those? And I do want to say this as well. I want to encourage everybody, uh, check out Dr. Amy's books. In fact, I've got a couple of them here with me right now, the thyroid connection and the autoimmune solution. So if you've got an autoimmune disease, the book is fantastic really going through the root cause, taking care of your gut and leaky gut and all the things that I know I've, I've mentioned here before. But again, checking that out, the autoimmune solution and the thyroid connection. And then her programs, uh, you can find at amymyersmd.com. So she's going to talk to a little bit the, about the solutions now. But if you really want to do a deep dive, I really recommend you check out her books and programs too. So yeah, let's talk about some of the solutions here. Yeah. So We'll talk with candida first, since that was sort of our initial right. topic. So we'll, with both candida and SIBO, you're essentially starving those either bad bacteria or the candida overgrowth. The diets, there's some very minimal differences to them. Some people you know, have uh, problems with uh, some of the prebiotics with SIBO, and some people have problems with some of the more fermented foods with yeast. But essentially, you're starving them by going on a very low-carb diet. Um, you know, getting rid of, of course, the very inflammatory foods, the glutens, the dairies, the sugars, the alcohols, all that kind of stuff. But even good, uh, what are perceived to be good foods like grains and legumes and beans, these, I was a vegetarian for 27 years. I now eat a paleo diet or the Myers way diet, as I call it. But, um, you know, these foods, even these, what we're taught to think of these healthy foods are still carbohydrates and they are food for the candida and for the SIBO. So we recommend getting, you know, those, even those more healthy grains and legumes and things like that out of the diet. Um, then for candida, what you want to do is you starve the yeast and then you want to kill the yeast. Now, after working with patients in my clinic, um, of course, being a physician, you can prescribe, if you see a doctor, an antifungal medication. These can be very powerful. You also have to be very careful. They can be a bit toxic on your liver. So you would definitely obviously want to be working with a physician. I've helped thousands of people you know, around the world in my books and programs, tens of thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands have read the book. So um, you know, I formulated two supplements that I used in my clinic and the program, the Candida Breakthrough Program uses exactly the diet and the supplements that I used in my clinic with my patients for a decade. So Can Defense is a product that I formulated, which is a really powerful blend of all natural plant enzymes that really help to break down the yeast cell wall and all the starches that the, that the yeast feeds on. So they have celluloses in there um, that are really powerful that our body can't produce on their own. So we need this to help break down that yeast cell wall of the candida and then it dies. And then caprylic acid, which is short chain fatty acids um, that are derived from all natural coconut oil, um, they sort of poke holes in the yeast cell wall. So I call it my one, two punch. If these enzymes digesting the yeast cell wall, and then this caprylic acid poking holes in the yeast cell wall. And between those two things, they kill the yeast, but they're not really affecting your good microbiome. Uh, so that's super important. You know, a lot of products, some people always ask oil of oregano. Well, I mean, that can be amazing, but it's like a bomb going off. It can kill the good stuff and the bad stuff. So in medicine, we always want to focus on what's the most specific to the thing that we're treating right now because we don't want a bomb to go off. I mean, if you've tried everything, maybe oil of oregano might be a place to go, but it shouldn't be the starting point because you could kill off good bacteria, bad bacteria, and the yeast. And so we really want to preserve and get that rainforest back in balance. And so we want to preserve the good bacteria that we have and only kill those yeast, which is exactly what the caprylic acid and the can defense do. And then the third step of the program is to re-inoculate the gut. So I use a very high um, potency probiotic, again, that I formulated that's pharmaceutical grade. It has 14 of the most important strains in there that have really been shown to help um, rebalance and repopulate your good bacteria, um, as well as, um, you know, warding off or over, you know, we're trying to get that rainforest back in balance. So we're sort of going in with this big amount of probiotics to repopulate that. Um, and so that is for candida. I mean, it's what I call the, you know, it's three steps to candida. For SIBO, on the other hand, you know, again, we start with that same diet where we're sort of killing off the SIBO. And then we use a product that we say we, rather than killing the SIBO, because we do, those are good bacteria. And we don't want to kill them all. We prune back the bacteria. And we use a product called Microbex, uh, Microbex 
which is a blend of herbs of black walnut, berberine, and it helps to sort of prune back um, those good yet overgrown bacteria. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm interested because black walnut and berberine, we just, we just love your uh, thoughts on this. You know, traditionally throughout history, they've been used as anti-parasites. So just curious if there's a relationship there or, um, yeah, just, just, just curious about that. Yeah, well, so many people have parasites as well. And so I formulated the product to be able to help with SIBO or parasites. Okay, so we well. actually have a parasite program. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm, it also has a little bit of caprylic acid in there. So it can also help with candida. Yeah. It's sort of a little bit more of my catch-all product, yeah. but yet not as powerful as say something like oil of oregano. That is very powerful. I mean, oil of oregano works, people. Um, I don't carry it or sell it because I personally think for the average person out there, it can be way too powerful. This is this delicate microbiome and balance that you want to have. And you kind of, again, you know, pruning back things. So, um, so, you know, that, that's just sort of my personal take on, sure. on you know, the big guns. And so we're here again, sort of pruning. Now, the big difference between SIBO and Candida is the probiotic that you use or that I use to, to help people with SIBO. We use a soil-based organism of three different uh, soil-based organisms because remember SIBO actually is already an overgrowth of that lactobacillus and sometimes uh, bifidobacter, which are two very powerful and most common uh, probiotics or strains in your gut, but you already have too much of it. So you do not want to, you know, take the 100 billion unit probiotic that I recommend in Candida. And a lot of people are like, well, I have them both. What do I do? So we, in my programs, there's a lot of overlap and you can just, you know, do one program, but we tell you how to do it if you're trying to treat both at the same time. What we recommend is that you hold off on the 100 billion, take the soil based for 30 days along with the Candida and uh, SIBO stuff. And after your 30 days, go in and add in the 100 billion. So it's another thing you can kind of tell for yourself if you might have SIBO, when you go take a probiotic, do you get more bloated? Do you feel worse? Those can be just the re-establishing and rebalancing the microbiome, or it could be a clue that you have SIBO and you've just introduced more of that good bacteria into your gut and you already have too much of it. I, I love that recommendation, especially for a condition like SIBO. It's, uh, it's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the diets are very similar. Um, sort of, again, what you're treating them with, um, they're more specific to each condition. And then the probiotic is specific to each condition as well. Wow. I love that. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, and talking about, and, and I think SIBO is one of those things. Now, people have been talking about SIBO for, for quite a few years now, but I think um, a lot of people are realizing, hey, I think I have SIBO. As you're talking about the bloating, especially so many people today have issues with bloating and gas and other digestive issues. And uh, you know, and obviously SIBO is one of those things that can cause problems. As we're talking about both of these issues with candida and with SIBO, just give me a list. And I know you could probably list 20 things off at least, but what are maybe three of your things you're like, you got to stay away from these, whether it's a food or a practice or whatever it is. And what are maybe three things you're saying diet wise, you should definitely be eating this? Uh, for both SIBO and Candida? Yeah, and if you want to separate and maybe you're saying, hey, sauerkraut may be good for this, not good, or a, okay. a certain other foods. But yeah, whatever, however you want to answer this is great. Yeah, okay. Well, first I would say probably the one overlooked one, and I like to always bring it up in a talk because it helps remind me that it's my most overlooked one as well, although it's staring me in the face, um, is stress. So stress is yeah. known to alter your microbiome and to suppress you know, your immune system and suppress your good bacteria. And so just stress alone, whether it's a physical stress, I mean, there's studies showing that, you know, running a marathon afterwards, they check somebody's white blood count and it's suppressed. The microbiome is, is altered. So whether it's a physical stress, even one that you've chosen to do like an Ironman or a, you know, marathon, or it's, you know, stressors perceived or real in your life, of, you know, owning a fast growing company or, you know, uh, building a house and a, and an office building at the same time and having a two and a half year old at home. So um, those things are um, so stress. And so I like to bring that one up because I um, you know, try to do my best with relieving stress, which is what I write about in my books. But you know, that's the one everybody's so, fo so focused on food, 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 food. We've almost gotten like hyper focused on food and that in and of itself can be a stress. So stress is one that I would say for both SIBO and Candida. Um, in terms of food, so I feel differently than the vast majority of people out there 
um, about fermented foods. And this really goes back to my working clinically with patients for over a decade and just what I saw. So everybody's an individual and, you know, I'm sure over the course of your podcast, you'll hear people will hear varying degrees and this, you know, this is this way and the next person saying, no, it's that way. So everybody is an individual, but for me as a whole, uh, personally and um, in my clinic for 10 years, um, I avoided fermented foods for people who were doing candida or SIBO. A lot of people with SIBO, again, have histamine issues. Fermented foods can cause issues with histamine. And then, you know, I mean, foods that are fermented, in order to be fermented, I mean, they're, they're using yeast and bacteria to ferment the food. And for some people, they have cross reactivities to that. You know, when I, when I first started um, with the Institute for Functional Medicine way back, uh, you know, forever ago, and I remember they were like, um, if you have candida, take, um, take S. Velarde. And then, you know, I went to the next talk. It's like, if you have candida, do not take S. Velarde. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. it's a yeast that's a good yeast that's supposed to fight the yeast. And the answer is both of those are true, right? Some people, it, they're going to really react to it and you should not use it with them. And other people are going to really thrive with it. Yeah. And early on in my practice, I used S. Velarde, And then along the way, I stopped using it. And then, you know, on a very individual basis, if I felt like, you know, somebody needed to try it, we'd try it. But it was very few people. So that's how I personally feel about fermented foods. And then they're a great thing to bring back in after you've gone through the programs and you're trying to reestablish um, that good bacteria. But that's another thing. Sorry that I'm just so long winded here. Just one final thought. Oh, you're great. Okay. Um, I used to speak at a conference, you know, paleo conference and all these people would come and they're eating all this fermented food and they come up to me and they're like, since I started paleo, I feel so much worse. Like, because they were eating all this, in my opinion, eating all this fermented stuff they had guts that were filled with yeast and, and SIBO and all this stuff. And then they were just almost adding food to it. So, um, and my one final comment is I do not believe that people can recover from candida and SIBO without either pharmaceutical intervention, the diet and pharmaceutical intervention, or the diet and a program like mine with the three steps. I do not think for the vast, vast majority of people that diet alone can, can solve these issues. That is, again, in my 10 years of experience and people following programs and stuff, you really need to do the diet. You need to have something in there to kill or prune back whatever you're doing, and you need to go back in and re-inoculate, whether it's probiotics or later with fermented foods. Yeah, you know, one of the things, and in, in the point you're bringing up, and some people respond well, some people respond very poorly to fermented foods. I mean, this is, I've, I've spent the, I, a good many of the past years studying Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine. And, and you know, and, and what these ancient uh, forms of medicine teach us is that uh, not everybody is meant to have the exact same diet, you know, and yeah. what you're saying, and everybody is, is wired so differently. And so, you know, in Chinese medicine, uh, everything you're describing is typically caused uh, as a, uh, it's referred to as a spleen chi deficiency. Uh, thing in and, and sometimes the liver issues where things aren't moving quick enough throughout your body. But all that being said, just uh, for 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 everyone listening, it's important to remember: listen to your body. Some people I found do well with fermented foods, but as you're saying, a lot of people, especially people with severe autoimmune disease, they have a in, in gut issues. They do not do very well with fermented foods. Uh, whether it be sauerkraut or many of the other fermented foods, especially something like kombucha. I actually don't even think that's hardly good for anybody, but that's a whole nother thing. But anyways, all that yeah. being said, I, I think it's a great point. Um, and I think, again, one of my messages would be listen to your body because just because somebody says it's healthy and everybody's raving about the next superfood or whatever it is, a lot of people don't, you know, not everybody responds well to the same foods. And you may find that over time you don't tolerate something. And then after you've healed a gut infection and then you can, or you can and then you go somewhere and you have overindulge in something or you had to get a round of antibiotics or you got Montezuma's revenge and then suddenly you can't. And so these things, I mean, that's what I talk about in the autoimmune solution is that it's the autoimmune spectrum and it's on this continuum. I mean, I had autoimmunity, I got well, um, and then um, I moved into a house and had toxic mold and I was sleeping on a balcony for a month as sick as I possibly could be. It was right in the middle of writing the thyroid connection. And, um, and then, you know, it has taken me, I got well very quickly by getting back on the diet really hardcore and doing a lot of different things, of course, moving out of the place. But, you know, it's been, you know, 
I got well and then recently I started doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy and all my autoimmune markers, I got them back the other day, totally, totally normal and negative and I've been feeling great. So who knows what life may bring me again in the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, right? I mean, it's um, even to those of us that do this for a living, there are things outside of our control, you know, having a baby, uh, moving into a toxic mold place. I mean, th things that can just happen to you that yeah. um, is just life. And so I would just, you know, advise people that it is a journey and, and you don't reach the destination of I'm healthy now and you just stay there. I mean, hopefully you do, but there could be something else that knocks you off and you got to get back on and, you know, it's ever moving, ever moving train. Oh yeah. All right, let's talk about thyroid disease. And then I want to talk about autoimmune disease too. So I know, again, you have an entire book, The Thyroid Connection on healing thyroid issues. T talk to me a little bit about thyroid issues. How prevalent are they? What are some of the biggest symptoms? And then what is your take on, here's what we need to do to start to fix these thyroid problems? Yeah, I mean, it's enormous. It's way more prevalent in women than men. But just, you know, I write about that in the book. Just because you're a man does not mean that you cannot have a thyroid condition. Yeah. And men are probably at higher risk for getting missed because the doctors, you know, they're not we women go to the OBGYN or the gynecologist, whatever, every year, right? Young women are doing that and they get checked. Men are not. And so well, well, what happens for men is they go in and they say, I'm tired. And it's like, you've got low testosterone. Yeah. Right. So, well, that's but, too. but, but yes, that's yeah. Right. And why do all these men now have low testosterone? So, I mean, that's a whole yeah. can of worms we could talk about between yeah. stress to cell phones and 5g coming. And, you know, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I, I could just, you know, crawl in a hole of feeling overwhelmed. Oh, yeah. um, so thyroid conditions are extremely prevalent. There are, you know, tens of millions of people with thyroid conditions, many of them undiagnosed um, because the symptoms can be super vague. Um, they tend to, I mean, again, the, the pendulum is switching and it is happening to younger and younger people. Why? We could have a whole conversation about that. But typically it was women in their 30s, 40s, 50s. And so this is when, you know, late 30s, when women have had babies. And so it's easy to say, oh, you're at home, you got a baby, you're getting up every few hours. Of course, your hair is falling out. You can't get rid of those last 10 pounds and you're exhausted. You're a new mom. Well, maybe that they're a new mom, but pregnancy and hormonal shifts, which is one of the thoughts behind why women have more thyroid and more autoimmunity in general is these hormonal shifts. So they tend to come out, you know, after pregnancy, around perimenopause, around menopause. And so for the most part, many of these symptoms can get brushed off as something else. You're going through menopause. Of course, you're tired or your hair is falling out or your skin is dry or you've gained 10 pounds. It really could just be menopause or it could be of a thyroid condition. For me personally, I had Graves, which is an overactive thyroid, which is less common than Hashimoto's or just low thyroid. And I got brushed off by my doctor. I mean, it's why I'm very passionate about what I do. I went to my doctor with, um, you know, I was eating literally two pieces of, I was eating gluten and dairy back then. I was a vegetarian, but I was eating two pieces of Ezekiel bread with butter on it at night to not wake up a pound thinner the next day. And, you know, had a trimmer and my legs were weak when I was going down the stairs. And, you know, I mean, I was typically always thin, but I was even thinner. Meanwhile, just eating a lot. And I go to the doctor and she says, oh, you're a second year med student. You're hearing all these diseases and you think that you have one of them. This is just medical school stress. And I said, wait a minute. I was in the Peace Corps. I lived on a dirt road in Paraguay by myself for two years. My mother died unexpectedly after four months of pancreatic cancer. Uh, I've never responded to stress this way. I, I don't think this is stress. I yeah. need a full workup. And I like demanded, but if I had been more timid or something, I would have said, okay, and I would have left. And, you know, she called me back a you know, week or so later and, you know, I don't think she really apologized. And she said, you have Graves disease. Um, and, you know, with Graves disease, you're really offered thyroid ablation, well, medication, thyroid ablation or surgery. And my dad was actually a professor of international studies and China was a specialty. So we had grad students from China all over our house growing up. And so I took Chinese medicine when I was little. We were rarely sick, but if we were, the first thing we got were herbs. Yeah. And so I actually went to Chinese medicine first. I said, you know, this isn't so bad. I, I, you know, I'm not ready to do any of this because I went to med school knowing I'd do what I'm doing, but I just didn't know how to get there. So I had done all my electives in integrative medicine. And, and so, you know, I knew that this was a path or a means to something else. So I wasn't really, you know, didn't want to just like ablate my thyroid. 
And that, you know, I did that for, I don't know, a month or two, and I didn't really feel like things were helping me. And so I went back and begrudgingly things were getting worse. And I took the PTU, which is the medication. And about a month later, you know, my skin was dry, my hair was falling out and I was exhausted. So I went back and he's like, he checked some blood work and he called me back and he said, your liver is, this medication is damaging your liver. Your enzymes are sky high. You've got to get in bed. You have something called toxic hepatitis and then figure out what you want to do. So I was the one in a million. They say one in a million it can happen to you. Well, I was the one in a million of, you know, toxic hepatitis from the PTU. And, um, you know, then I just, then I got ragingly hyperthyroid. I was just started my second year of med school. I thought it was going to fail out because I had to like be in bed for a few weeks. And it was extremely stressful. And I searched high and low. Functional medicine had barely started back then. There was nobody doing what, you know, what I did in my clinic. And so I had my thyroid ablated. Um, and, you know, I really vowed that from there I was going to listen to patients. No symptom was crazy. Uh, you know, I was going to test everybody. I mean, everybody that walked in the door, I tested for thyroid. And that's a whole nother thing that I write about in the Thyroid Connection, which is really a book to work with your doctor. You don't necessarily need to go to a functional doctor. You can go to your regular doctor and take my book. And, you know, the feedback that I've gotten is that people have been really fairly receptive. I mean, I'm M and MD, and so that tends to help with the situation. But, you know, when regular conventional doctors are checking for thyroid dysfunction, they're really checking a TSH, maybe a free T4, but they're not checking a free T3 or reverse T3. They're not checking your antibodies. And so I talk about all the labs and you can just, you know, take the sheet with you from the book to your doctor and say, you know, I want this full list and really look at it and then look at optimal reference ranges, not just normal reference ranges. So, I mean, I could go on and on about the thyroid, but what I would say why it is getting misdiagnosed or overlooked so often is that it's happening in women and generally speaking, doctors overlook us more than men. It's happening at women during times of change of their hormones. So it's easy to, you know, explain these symptoms to buy something else. The symptoms are often are vague and can, you know, be, you know, fatigue is totally vague. That could be a thousand different things. Um, and then, you know, they're using outdated reference ranges and they're not doing really a full thyroid panel as I would recommend that they, that they do. And so it's becoming, um, you know, a huge problem. I mean, again, I could spend a whole talk talking about why I think it's a problem, but that's why people are getting misdiagnosed or not diagnosed day in and day out. Yeah. I mean, it, it's surprising looking at, uh, I, I was interviewing, um, uh, a doctor yesterday and we were talking about some of the, uh, just, uh, she, she's a researcher. Her name is Dr. Rossi. She's over in London. And she was just talking about 15 years is sort of the time period between what the studies actually showed when doctors yeah. actually put things into practice and that's testing and recommendations and the whole thing. And it's just like, it's just crazy. It's yeah. Crazy. I mean, that, that's the research I've heard 18 years, maybe it's 15, but yeah. people all the time say, well, why aren't doc doctors talking about leaky gut? I said, well, Alessio Fasano discovered zonulin about 15 years ago. Yeah. So it's going to be even a few more years. And right now there, there are big drug companies racing to be the first to have a zonulin blocking drug. And the minute they yep. have that and they have a patent on it and they have all these reps, every doctor, every GI doctor will be talking left and right about leaky gut. And then we're, you know, it's like, well, we've been talking about this for 15, 20 years uh, now. You know? It's just wild to me. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's crazy. Um, it's crazy. So with, with thyroid conditions, you talked about one thing, which I know is such a big deal. I mean, stress is huge. Stress is huge for, for, for thyroid issues. Do, do you have any hacks? Like, what, what have you done yourself or what do you recommend patients do uh, to, to, to relieve stress? Anything specific? Yeah, I mean, it really just depends. Um, and that's what I do talk about relieving stress. I mean, you know, in my first book, they wanted me to come up with a whole program. And I said, you know, look, I'm a person who like, I'm going to do exactly what I'm told. So if somebody tells me to do this thing and then I don't like that thing, then I'm going to get stressed out about it. So you got to find the thing that works for you. For my husband, it's going to play 18 round, you know, holes of golf. Yeah. For me, it's, you know, getting in my hyperbarics or getting in my infrared sauna, you know, playing with my daughter, walking the dog. Um, I personally, because I'm a very goal oriented person, I use something called heart math. Um, I just have it right on my iPhone. Um, there's a little earpiece adapter. Uh, the app is free. I think the earpiece thing costs a hundred bucks, but you have your phone with you or I do at all times. And so I just try to do 10, 15 minutes in the morning, 10, 15 minutes in the, in the evening to at least just get my heart back in rhythm and in sync. 
So um, I hate to give somebody a program. It really just sure. depends. I mean, for someone that's having tea with a friend, for somebody else that's reading a book, for somebody else that's prayer, for somebody else that's meditation. I think the point is finding what it is for you rather than, again, like food, somebody says it's this. I mean, of course, there's a lot of research about yoga and meditation and, it, you know, if those things work for you and I've done them throughout various points of my life or prayer, you know, that that's amazing. So just finding the thing that the thing or things, you know, that work for you. But, you know, breathing, just taking a deep breath in and of itself, it's hard to be anxious when you're breathing and that's free. You do it every day. You just got to take a bigger, deeper one. Yeah. You know, nobody knows you're doing it. You don't look funny in line. You're just you know, taking a bigger, deeper belly breath. And, you know, that that's the easiest. But, um, you know, it, again, sorry, did not have a super specific. It really no, no, that, that was actually great. I mean, that's what I was looking for. The big thing is you've got to do things that you love. You got to do yeah. things that really stress for you. And so uh, I, I think the big thing that people need to remember is, scheduling it you know a lot of times we just say well I've got people say yes to everything as well right yeah. especially especially moms I know you take care of so many moms you are a mom and so I remember my mom growing up uh, my mom taught special ed uh, kids and she drove me to soccer practice and basketball practice and my brother and my sister and made dinner every night did all of these things and literally like I look at my mom I'm like I don't know when you had a second of you time so I think that's one of the things you're, you're saying too. It's like yeah. people need some you time, you know, and doing some things where they're unplugging a bit. But I think all those recommendations and things you mentioned were, uh, yeah, p p people can take a lot, lot from that. And that is the most important thing is scheduling it, right? I mean, because we, particularly women, but, you know, people put themselves last, right? I mean, they, they take care of everybody else and then it's last. And so, you know, I have my things and I have, you know, that I, chiropractor, the lymph massage. I mean, I have these things scheduled out like yep. weeks in advance every other week, you know, it's on the Friday. It's like, I've had a date with my chiropractor for the last three years since I got sick with toxic mold, 245 every Friday. Like, yep. you know, yep. only time I miss it is if I'm out of town. And then I usually schedule earlier in the week. So, um, he didn't do a lot of manipulations. He does more like sort of muscle testing and other things, energy work, but um, you know, finding that thing. I know that not everybody can do that, but you know, finding things if if there's a cost associated with that's free or you know, there's so much stuff online these days that you can. Yeah. Do. Yeah. Well, last thing I want to ask you about, and by the way, I mean, I I obviously I, I I've I've seen a chiropractor every 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 week for ten years and and, and loved it. Uh, let's talk about autoimmune disease. Okay, your first book that came out. And that's what I think I, I've interviewed, you know, I've interviewed you a couple of times. I know I've been on your, uh, you know, interviewed by you over the years, but the first book I read of yours was the autoimmune solution. Again, I love that book. You do a really great job of, you know, walking people through simple steps and the whole thing. And so, uh, if you're listening now and have an autoimmune disease, check out Dr. Amy's book, or if you have a friend or family member and they're struggling with autoimmune disease, it's a great gift for them as well. Um, let's just touch on this. Autoimmune disease, what's the root cause? And let's go over just a few solutions. And I know some of this is going to probably weave into some of the stuff you already talked about related to digestive issues, but we'd still love to hear uh, autoimmune disease because so many people struggle with that. Yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, I wrote that book and, you know, it was published in 2015 and it's, you know, been translated in like 10 different languages. It's in paperback now and it's still, you know, in the top like thousand books on Amazon. So, I mean, People are always asking, well, how'd you do that? I said, I wrote a book. I wanted to help people. Like I, like I have goosebumps. I was in this, you know, conventional medicine failed me. It's my mission to not have it fail you too. And that is what I did. I wrote a book to help people. And I have goosebumps because every day at my office, we have a little Slack channel and they have the Myers Way Love. And just people are posting from customer success to the online team, you know, of just feedback that they're getting from people all around the world who've gotten success. So, you know, it's a $10 book now and, you know, it could potentially you know, save or change your life. I mean, that's what we get. But so I think that there are five root causes and in the autoimmune solution, I refer to them as the four pillars um, that I mentioned of all sort of chronic illness. So diet, you know, in my book, I recommend, again, I was a vegetarian for 27 years, but I recommend getting rid of gluten, grains, and legumes. So you want to get rid of toxic and inflammatory foods. Toxic foods are like sugars and alcohol, um, inflammatory foods or gluten and dairy. I talk about how grains and legumes these days, the way that they're processed, have a lot of lectins still in them that can be irritating to the gut. Now, I, I you know, some people need it. The book is 30 day program. So some people need to do it for 30 days. Some people need to do it for 90, some 60, 120. And other people, you know, it doesn't mean 
um, you know, when I got well, then I occasionally will eat some rice or have some black beans if I'm out. But then when I got sick with toxic mold, like I went straight back to it. So I have my non-negotiable nose, gluten and dairy that no matter what I'm faced with, just non-negotiable, I'll starve. Um, and then, you know, during the process, what we do is help you figure out what are your no foods? Um, so we get into that, you know, cause as we've talked about all today, everybody's an individual. So you sort of go a bit more extreme in the beginning to, and then add foods back in and figure out what are your no's, what are, what can I do once a month? What can I do every day now? What can I never do again? So food is huge. And then healing your gut. And the first step in healing your gut is to remove all the bad stuff. So you're removing these foods that we just talked about. And then you're removing these infections that we've just spent a whole podcast talking about. So we go in and remove the candida, remove the SIBO, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, so, and then, you know, I'm sure people know, familiar with you, you know, the four hour program, you're going to go in and you're going to replace what's missing like digestive enzymes or HCL, you're going to re-inoculate with, you know, good bacteria. Um, and you're going to repair with, I have a product we use leaky gut revive, which is L-glutamine and marshmallow and, and slippery elm and things to help, you know, build up that barrier in the gut again. Um, and then tame the toxins is another one. And so toxins can be EMFs, you know, 5G, 4G, 3G. Um, I recently had my husband hardwire our whole house. So I no longer have Wi-Fi in our house, which is both annoying and really comforting at night. Um, yeah. So there's goods and bads to all of it. Um, so toxins, I mean, toxins can be, um, you know, can be, uh, heavy metals can be, um, you know, sort of toxins, infections, and stress can all be intertwined and could be one, you know, stress could be a toxin. Um, so, you know, get rid of toxins, beauty products. We women, you know, with the, with the makeup, I use beauty counter, you know, you want to, uh, Dr. Bronner's just soap, you know, looking at what you're wearing um, on your, you know, on your body, what's in your environment, what are your, your you know, clothes made out of, what are your um, furniture made out of? I mean, I know this can get overwhelming. So really, if you can focus on pillar one and pillar two, that gets so many people well. And then yeah. as you're able to move on or you haven't, um, you know, toxic mold, you know, I was doing my program and, you know, it's like suddenly I was having these symptoms and I just moved in with my husband, you know, or, you know, he wasn't my husband at the time. And then I started getting sick. So what is that toxin? Infections can be things like Lyme. They can be things like Epstein-Barr, um, herpes viruses, um, you know, uh, those types of infections, staph, different kind of latent infections in the body, and then stress. We've kind of spent some time on stress. And so, um, you know, again, by the time you got to my clinic, of course, we had to go through all five of these root causes because you had some part of all of them by the time you made it in my clinic. But there are definitely people who read the books and they just do step one and step two, which is healing the gut and changing your diet. And they are dramatic, dramatic results. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure you've had tons as well from people following your programs. I mean, it's, it is amazing. I mean, I remember when I started that my mentor said, cause I was an ER doctor and I wasn't used to patients coming back, you know, the ER was like, they come, you hopefully never see them again. And I was just really nervous about seeing people again. And he was like, don't worry about it. The diet. And you know, and it, like it, 80% of people get better with that alone. And then like in the beginning, it was like, oh my God, you know, people are just coming back so well. Yeah. Of course, as my clinic progressed and after writing books, I was seeing the more the serious thickest cases. The thickest and the more yeah. complex of the more complex. But yeah. That's great. I love it. Well, awesome. Well, Dr. Amy, I want to say thanks so much for today. I want to uh, just continue to uh, let everybody know, check out Dr. Amy's books, The Thyroid Connection and the autoimmune solution. There are bookstores nationwide. They're obviously on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. You can find them online. And uh, again, I just appreciate your expertise and, uh, and all that you do. So thanks so much. Well, thank you. Also, we have a free gift for your listeners. If they're interested, they can go to amymd.io forward slash candida foods and get a ebook that's all about candida, what are signs, symptoms, what they can do about it, the supplements I was talking about, the whole program. So it's a free gift for your listeners if they're interested. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Amy. Thanks everybody Bye. for listening to another show and uh, have a, uh, yeah, have a great week. Thanks, Dr. Amy. Thanks so much. Thanks. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. 